The mission of the Stanford Center on Longevity is to accelerate and implement uh, scientific advances and technological discoveries, behavioral practices, and new social norms in ways that will support century-long lives that are uh, healthy uh, and rewarding. In, in less than a century, life expectancy increased in the developed world on average uh, 30 years. And you know, this is at once an extraordinary cultural achievement and among the greatest challenges of the 21st century. We stand committed at the center to transform the culture so that the majority of people arrive at old age mentally sharp, physically fit, and financially secure. So longer lives are giving us the opportunity to reimagine what long and healthy lives might look like from youth all the way to very old age. And arguably the greatest impediment, the greatest barrier so far to really redesigning life is, in my humble opinion, a lack of imagination. <laughs> I mean, so far, we've taken all these extra 30 years and we tacked them all on at the end, <laughs> which is why we could not be happier <laughs> uh, to welcome our speaker today, Ms. Courtney Martin, to the Distinguished Lecture Series. A reimagining of successful life is an essential part of longevity, and Ms. Martin is leading this new thinking about life and what a good life looks like. Uh, she is the, an author and an entrepreneur. Uh, her latest book is called The New Better Off, which explores how people are redefining the American dream so that it's more fulfilling, uh, so that communities are more engaged, so that families interact more. Uh, Courtney is the co-founder of the Solutions Journalism Network and as a strategist for the TED Prize. She's also co-founder and partner at Valenti Martin Media and Fresh Speakers Bureau. She is editor emeritus at feministing.com and a weekly columnist for On Being. She has appeared on the Today Show, Good Morning America, MSNBC, The O'Reilly Factor, and she speaks widely at conferences and colleges. She is the recipient of the Ellie Wiesel Prize in Ethics and has held a residency from the Rockefeller Foundation at the Bellagio Center. She lives with her family in a co-housing community called Temescal Commons in Oakland. And today, Courtney will speak to us uh, about how the ways that Americans are beginning to reject traditional measures of success and happiness and rethink what it means uh, to have a good long life. Without further ado, join me in welcoming Ms. Courtney Martin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Laura. Such a generous introduction. Thank you to Laura and Rika and everyone else who put energy into bringing me here. It's such an honor. Um, Laura and I were just talking about sort of the defi definition of longevity and th the way the center relates to it, and I was so moved by it because it's kind of everything I'm so interested in, but I've never quite had the framing for. So, I'm I'm personally kind of very excited to learn from everyone here. Um, you know, I wrote this book. It came out in uh, August. Of, of last year. So you might imagine a few things have happened since August um, on sort of the political scale that, uh, that have influenced some of my thinking about it. And I didn't want to shy away from that, particularly in this important moment. So I want to start by saying, you know, that I'm a journalist by training. The journalist Walter Lippmann wrote, the way in which the world is imagined determines at any particular moment what men will do. I would, of course, amend it to say men and women. Um, but this speaks to some of what Laura was referencing, imagination, the failure of imagination that we've had so far in this country to reimagine the American dream. And I actually think that's at the heart of what's happened in the last few months in this country. Um, when Trump was elected and, you know, 60 million people voted for him, I kept thinking about what, what was it that was operating at the center of, of those votes for many people. And it's my deep belief that part of that was because people have been made very vulnerable by a sense of their own disappointment about what we talk about as the American dream, what we sort the sort of you know shiny package we sell it as. Where did that disappointment come from? It came from a sense that people had been promised something that never transpired. 
Like kids who rush down the stairs to find empty stockings in a tree with no presents under it, I think Americans, white Americans in particular, have been raised on an American dream story, ached through adulthood, and have this embittering sense that Uncle Sam never came. I first started thinking about the importance of the American dream and our failure of imagination around it when I was working on this book that I mentioned, The New Better Off, Reinventing the American Dream. I read a statistic that really got in my gut. I could not stop thinking about it. For the first time in history, the majority of American parents do not believe that their kids will be better off than they were. Now, when I read that historic poll, it didn't feel sad to me. It felt like a provocation. Better off based on whose standards? Now, if I were to ask you to describe the current markers of the American dream, what comes to mind? You can just shout them out. What do you think of as, like, this is when you've really made it, you have this? House, white picket fence. House, white picket fence. What else? Class mobility. Class mobility. Upwardly mobile, right? It's about money, first and foremost. What else? Successful, Successful children. What was that back there? Comfortable retirement, right, probably a high status job of some kind, a secure job, right, is the kind of language you use. So we've all, we've all, you know, through osmosis learned what this thing is, this American dream thing that we're all supposed to aspire for. The, the story is pretty clear. Work hard, climb the, ch climb the ladder, and achieve status if you're a guy. Be a nurturing, beautiful mother if you're a woman. Buy a big house with a white picket fence and have 2.5 well-behaved, high-achieving kids, right? Um, a lot of us, I think, have broken hearts over the facts that our lives actually don't add up like this because we have been raised with this image in our heads so strongly. And this is both people who have lived in, you know, have generations of families who've been in this country and those who've come to this country with that dream as sort of, you know, the talisman that they, they go through so much struggle to reach. Um, I'd like to propose that part of why this country is where it is, is at this moment, is because we have not been brave enough to admit that that version of the dream is dead. And that if it ever existed, it was morally corrupt in the first place. And that's not just a failure on the parts of Republicans. I don't think Democrats are brave enough to say that either. Very few people in our sort of cultural, political landscape are brave enough to say, the dream, as we conceived of it, was morally corrupt. Certain people had access to it, and certain people didn't. And that going forward, we need a new dream. We need a new way to articulate what success and quality of life and longevity, this beautiful word, actually means. So for me, that's not sad. I know when you say something is dead, that sounds very sad. For me, that's actually like this beautiful opening up. If we say that the, the historical dream is dead, this stale thing that we all keep sort of banging our heads against trying to create, what might we create in its place? And even more hopeful in some ways, what are we already creating that we don't realize is so valuable, that we think is just like how life is done, but we're actually nurturing beautiful relationships, meaningful work, things that we should feed more and more and more because they're actually what life is about. So I reported and wrote this book with that question in mind, kind of, you know, A, what could the dream be? And B, what is it already under the radar? What are things that are happening that we just don't pay attention to as journalists, as, as people sort of moving through the world? And, and I also want to say this question was especially exciting for me because there was sort of a confluence of economic and personal um, things happening that made it the perfect book to report at this moment. Economically, of course, you know, the emperor had no clothes all of a sudden, the market crashed, the housing bubble burst. This was all right at the time that I was becoming a so-called adult. So I was at kind of late 20s, early 30s going, OK, what is my adult life going to look like? And all of a sudden, the economic story kind of dropped out of the American dream. So I couldn't even have a delusion about what all of that meant to me. I had to get real about what I could afford and what mattered, et cetera. So, so this economic confluence in my own personal quest of saying, like, OK, I'm becoming an adult. I need to figure out if I'm gonna, how I'm going to live, how I'm going to work, am I going to have kids, how am I going to make all of that work, came together at this really important moment. So the book is both my journalistic training of reporting, et cetera, but it's also a very personal book in the sense that I was trying to kind of live through these things. And, and you'll see that in some of what I talked today, about today. I wrote the majority of it um, right as my daughter, my first daughter was being born. Um, and, you know, as I was getting used to parenthood, and now I have a three-and-a-half-year-old and a, a nine-month-old, so I was kind of in the thick of, you know, what does this adult, so-called adult life look like? 
So I want to talk about two elements today, and I'm very excited for the Q&A, so I hope you'll be thinking about your own pushback, you know, what doesn't resonate, um, you know, what questions do you have. But I'm going to talk about two, two things. One is work, and one is, one is how we work, and one is how we live. Pretty fundamental questions. So first, how we work. Get a little drink of water here. There's really nothing, I think we could probably argue, all agree, more central to the idea of the American dream than this notion of a secure job, right? It's, it's something that, you know, we grew up with as kids, thinking, what is my secure job going to be? But they're practically extinct, at least as defined by our grandparents' generation. We now move jobs every 4.7 years. By 2020, nearly half of the workforce will be freelance. Half of the workforce will be freelance by 2020. Right? That's four years away. Even if that statistic doesn't end up proving completely accurate, it gives you a sense of the direction in which we're moving. And even so-called traditional jobs have less and less robust benefit packages. So we have this really out-of-date conversation about basically W-2 workers or 1099 workers and act as if the two things have nothing to do with each other. And actually work is getting totally remixed in a million different ways. So just because you have a W-2 doesn't mean you have great benefits, as probably lots of people in this room could attest. And just because you have 1099 doesn't mean you don't have really intense relationships with your employers that kind of look like W-2 employment. So those old, outdated ways of thinking about structurally how work happens need to be reimagined. Um, increasingly, as I said, even full-time jobs don't have a lot of security. And for too long, the cultural archetype of the freelancer in our heads has been this like 22-year-old still in their boxers at 2 p.m., eating a slice of pizza in front of a, a numbing, you know, green glow of the computer screen in a filthy apartment, right? In fact, 38% of millennials are freelancers, 38%, but so are 32% of those over 35. How many freelancers in this room? Just see a show of hands. All right, so not, this room is actually less freelancy than, than the average, uh, you know, if we did a microcosm of the American workforce. I, I have been freelance my entire adult life. I have never had health insurance provided by an employer, and I'm 37 years old. Am I 37? Yeah, 37 years old, so just to give you a, a sense. That would be more typical, obviously, of journalists because, the, you know, the field of journalism has, has um, fallen apart in a way that there are so many freelancers. The traditional nine to five no longer really works for anyone, right? Punch, punch clocks are becoming obsolete as are career ladders. It's all nonlinear. And yet we keep talking about these things in old terms with that old dream in mind. So we ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? As if they'll choose one job and have that for the, their entire careers. When in fact, as I said, most people are moving jobs every 4.7 years. So one of the things I came away from this book feeling is that what we really need to ask kids is how do you want to be when you grow up? Because the circumstances of their jobs will change constantly, but if they understand who they are and what their gifts are and how they like to be plugged into any context, they will be useful and always employable, right? So the less we, we act like work is this external thing, there's this straight path that you need to figure out, and the more that we emphasize you need to understand yourself and what you're good at and how to be useful to all kinds of different groups of people, the more quote unquote secure you will be. And to the point about security, the other thing I walked away from reporting on this book feeling and, and does resonate with my own experience in my life is that true security often comes from a great network, not from the perfect package, right? We have this notion that you negotiate your security when you get your job offer and then it's done. Well, actually, since people are moving jobs so frequently, you're far, it's, it's a much better investment of your energy to think about how do you create a broad, vital network of human beings that you're in relationship with, and that is security over a lifetime, right? That means if you, loo you lose your job at a particular moment, you have people to look to to generate new opportunities. Um, to, the, to this point, I found one of the most fascinating things um, in my research was the explosion of co-working culture. This is actually the hub in Oakland. I don't know if anyone has, has been there. There's also a, a very vibrant uh, hub co-working space in San Francisco. Co-working is a growing movement as faces and people, usually independent contractors, another word for freelancers, who've realized that working together makes for happier, more productive work lives. So they're making it happen without the hierarchy. The spaces vary, but they're generally membership-based and value-driven. People who belong tend to believe in collaboration, openness, accessibility, and sustainability. 
There are thousands of co-working spaces listed in the co-working space directory. This is a wiki that's collectively owned and operated. More than 450 of them participate in what they call a co-working visa program, which I love, where you can belong to a space in Iowa, for example, but spend a few days working at one in Italy. So there's this sort of this global citizen mentality of where you work and how you work. Now, it's hard to come by reliable statistics, as you might imagine, because this is such a decentralized movement. But DeskMag, which sort of keeps track of some of this, had, does an annual survey of the 3,000 people across the world who run these spaces. And they found that 7 out of 10 say they cannot keep up with the demand of people who want to buy memberships and work in these spaces. Um, WeWork, which folks might have heard of, there are locations um, here in the Bay Area, have built an empire of sorts. They have 52 locations in 16 cities across the globe, currently valued at $10 billion. In a sense, what I find inspiring is that it's freelancers are scraping together this, the parts of company life that they really want and shedding the stuff that sucked the life out of them, right? So toxic culture, compulsory collaboration, unnecessary busy work, rigid business hours. They're, they're letting go of that stuff and they're rebuilding what fed them in friendlier, more flexible forms. And interestingly, it's working. Um, researchers Gretchen Spreitzer, Peter Boschiff, and Lyndon Garrett wrote in the Harvard Business Review, this is a direct quote, as researchers who have for years studied how employees thrive, we were surprised to discover that people who belong to co-working spaces report levels of thriving that an, an approach an average of six on a seven-point scale. This is at least a point higher than the average for employees who do their jobs in regular office, offices and something so unheard of, we had to look at the data again, which I found so interesting. When they got the results back, they sort of didn't believe them themselves, but it did check out. And they found that the, the wide variety of reasons for co-working happiness were most centrally described as communities characterized by authenticity, autonomy, and diversity. Communities characterized by authenticity, autonomy, and diversity. Now, these are not like glorified Starbucks, as one might imagine. Um, there's actually some real intention behind these um, environments that people are creating. There's a manifesto that was collectively, and crea uh, collectively created and now signed by people all over the world working in 1,700 different co-working spaces. And it begins, we envision a new economic engine composed of collaboration and community in contrast to the silos and secrecy of the 19th, 20th century economy. So this is not just like we found a place to plug in our laptops. These are people with like a deep commitment to something larger, a vision of how people might work and thrive and collaborate together. Now, still on this topic of how we work, I wanted to move from sort of this personal individual piece and cultural piece to a political level. Um, as I said, the 1099-W2 dichotomy, most people agree, is no longer particularly useful, um, especially in an economy you know, when, when gigs are exploding. Everyone knows about you know, the, the conversations around Uber drivers and, you know, and the safety net and how do we take care of people and of course people want the flexibility of those kinds of jobs but at the end of the day people also need some sort of security and so there, some of the brightest minds in this country right now are thinking about those really hard and really interesting questions. What does it look like in a decentralized economy to take care of workers? Um, one of the things that's being most discussed is a portable social safety net. So this is the kind of thing that that People would travel with people. Obamacare is actually like a good antecedent to understanding what that might look like, how it would be structured. Um, and there's a really strangely wonderful, um, atypical group of people coming together working on this. You have kind of people who lean more libertarian, you have kind of tech entrepreneurs, you have old school labor organizers. People who normally would not sit in the room together and have this kind of a conversation are coming together and, and wondering out loud together you know, how to remake the social safety net. The other thing is that labor organizing itself is getting reinvented, right? You, you don't always have a situation where you have some you know, mean boss who everyone is going to target to get labor practices changed. It just doesn't work that way any, anymore, right? So people are, are reinventing how labor organizing works. One of those... Um, people is a, a woman that I profile in the book named Michelle Miller. Along with her partner, Jess Kutch, she created something called coworker.org. They're focused on creating what they call workplace democracy, which they define quite simply as the principle that employees should have a voice in determining their working conditions and wages. 
They write, the history of working people taking steps to improve their lives and their working conditions extends back centuries, long before collective bargaining was codified into law in America and elsewhere. At cowork.org, we're interested in building technology for the labor movement of the future, one that's nimble, responsive, and inclusive of all working people. So for now, it's mostly an online petition platform, although they're, they're interested in doing other things. And so it's an online petition platform. Workers can go on, create their own campaigns, and then try to galvanize their you know, colleagues to join them. And I put to you, what do you think is, is like the number one thing that, that people, employees, have been putting uh, uh, petitions up about? Topics, you'd imagine. Health care. What else? Retirement. Child care. A lot of people say minimum wage because there's been such great minimum wage campaigns. Um, no, tattoos and beards. <laughs> now let me let me tell you why this matters because it's very interesting. A lot of the initial campaigns have been about self-expression. Christy Williams, a 24-year-old barista, for example, wanted Starbucks to overturn its ban on visible tattoos. On long days behind the espresso machine, she liked gazing down at her daughter's name scrawled across her arm. It seemed archaic and out of step with Starbucks' reputation that she was forced to cover up. The staff at cowork.org supported Christy to figure out how to spread the word on social media and keep the pressure on the company, and within two months, over 15,000 people signed her petition and Starbucks changed the policy worldwide. Since that time, there have been nearly a dozen other dress code campaigns directed at as many other employers. And Michelle, who was a hardcore SEIU labor organizer before she founded coworker.org, was struck that these kinds of campaigns often scoffed at by traditional labor organizers prove vital to the look and feel of collective organizing. She said, we think workers should be able to run the campaigns on whatever they want. And what we're seeing is that if someone experiences a win organizing with their coworkers about beards, then they get interested in what they might be able to advocate for in terms of work hours or for fair pay, health care, retirement, minimum wage, some of these other things, child care that people were, were shouting out. So in the increasing prominence of the gig economy, the challenge is, the opportunity is that we're actually listening to workers and listening to, in terms of, of kind of a behavioral economy lens, that this is how many people, the progression of their political involvement doesn't start at health care necessarily. It might start at, I want to look at my daughter's name on my arm when I'm making that espresso. Um, but once I get into that political process and learn how it feels to have power and how I can organize people, I'm, I'm going to advocate for different health care. I'm going to ad advocate for different wages, right? So there's sort of this hubris of traditional organizing that's being challenged in a way that I think is really fascinating. The other thing is the piece I mentioned about, you know, there's not, no longer always kind of a big bad boss in the sky. Um, collective bargaining was really based on power accruing in just one place. And as we know, in, in the age of the internet, et cetera, that's not how power always accrues. Sometimes it's very decentralized. And I'm encouraged that the cutting edge of dignity, as I like to think about it, is with these people. Um, this is the Domestic Workers Alliance. They successfully organized a totally decentralized workforce. You can imagine child care providers, people who take care of, of those with disabilities or in older age who need support. This workforce is deeply decentralized. And they have managed to organize them. And what I love even more is organize them along with their employers. So instead of seeing employers as the enemies, seeing them as their allies, if, if they can create agreements together about what a living wage is for people in this profession, if they can talk about dignity. Um, because as, as many of us in this room know who employ people like this, I have a, a child care provider that is so important to me. It's actually not an only adversarial relationship, right? That's a very old school labor organizing way of thinking about uh, organizing for power. But actually, I have a lot invested in the dignity of the person, Betsy, that I work with, right? So thinking about that differently. I'm very inspired by the work they're doing. And to this point, some of the most impressive innovation out there is being architected by poor people. The 14.4% of Americans living in poverty need money, obviously. but. We, we really do a disservice if we think all the innovation is happening, you know, in Silicon Valley, that all the innovation is happening against, or uh, among, you know, white dudes, 25-year-old white dudes in hoodies, right? A lot of the most interesting innovation is happening by domestic workers who figured out how to team up with their employers to organize for power differently. And so we really need to be looking at the people in our society who we've historically thought of as sort of poor, and, and not having power to think about the way that they're using power, because often it jives better with our current economic and political landscape than those who have thought about power in this top-down way for so many years. 
So now I want to talk about how we live. Other than work, our next biggest symbol of the American dream is this, right? The white picket fence. Um, it's this quintessential kind of suburban boundary marker that's taken up powerful residence in our collective con consciousness. The fence is a, the quintessential American symbol of self-containment and self-possession. It suggests an intimate world with its own mores, and those who dwell within get all of their needs met by one another, right? That's the story we tell. Now, all of those, uh, those of us who live inside a house with some configuration of family know it's not always that pretty, but that's the story we tell, and the fence is, is the best symbol we have of it. But it's never quite what it seems, right? Subprime mortgages undermine the already shaky foundations of our obsession with home ownership. Our new economic normal causes us to turn to one another, no matter how humbling. And this gets back to my point about who the innovators in our current culture are. A lot of times, poor people have spent years needing to turn to one another, and now those who have had the appearance of having more economic security are sometimes having to turn to one another, and they haven't done it in a long time. They've been under this delusion that all of their needs can be met in one place. Uh, so we, we've shown that if we strip away the sen sentimentality, what a white picket fence really does more than anything else is divides us from our neighbors, public space from private, the part of the world that we, the owners, will take responsibility for, and the part that is not ours to bother with. It's not a fence that keeps people safe. It's too squat. It's too smooth. It's a fence that keeps people apart. So what's happening instead, for now among a creative rebellious minority, but one that is growing and diversifying all the time, is a rejection of that fence and the sort of highly privatized life that happens within it. People are becoming focused less on owning, but even when they do, they're buying and living within homes with a distinctive, different mentality. So this is why I want to tell you a little bit about how I live. This is my co-housing community. Um, I live in that little place with the two orange chairs. And this is at 42nd and Telegraph in Temescal, Oakland, which I'm sure a lot of you have, have been to. We're right near Burma Superstar, for those who are obsessed with that restaurant. Um, and this was founded uh, about 15 years ago now by initially a group of people who went to church together and were looking for a way to kind of live their values on a, on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis. Now it's an interfaith community. There are about 25 of us um, who age in range from my daughter Stella, who's nine months, uh, to Louise, who's 78, a single woman who lives in a studio apartment. Um, so there's a range of, of housing um, sort of configurations, and, and there's everybody in between. Um, Buddhists, Christians, agnostics, uh, still has a dominant Christian vibe because of how it was founded in many ways. Um, and we eat together twice a week, Thursday nights and Sunday nights are common meals. That um, red building there is where the common house is. That bottom floor is an industrial sized kitchen and eating area. Um, it's also where like my women's group meets once a month and s some people have Bible groups and some people have, you know, my husband runs a father's group and other things. So we use that space for lots of different kinds of meetups. But every Thursday night and Sunday night we have dinner together. Uh, every uh, every Saturday, one Saturday a month, we do work day together. So we come together and have breakfast and then do whatever needs to be done on the land. Um, and, and then we just function with the philosophy that the place was founded with and still operates with is what we call radical hospitality. And this was, you know, it's kind of a phrase that you think of as sort of co-opted by like the tourism industry. But what we mean by it, radical hospitality, is this notion of that anyone who walks through the door deserves to be treated with dignity and kindness that you know, people can come to Common Meal without being officially invited. It's this notion of, of just taking care of people where they are, how they are, no matter who they are. And there's just that sense of, of openness. Um, there are 160 such communities uh, 25 years into the experiment in America. 25 years in and only 160 of these communities. And I hope you got the sense from the way I described it that this is is, you know, I'm very averse to kind of magic bullet thinking. I don't think there's any one solution for anything, but I will say of many of the solutions I've ever been exposed to for a lot of our American problems, this one hits so many buttons, right? We have intergenerational activity so that we're taking care of our aging community members. They're teaching our kids and giving them a bunch of wisdom and sense of, of you know, what it's like to be older and what matters, et cetera. We have, um, what we call revolutionary parenting, that's bell hooks term, revolutionary parenting. So I'm not on the hook to make sure my kids 
are perfect human beings and that I meet every one of their needs. I have a bunch of aunties and uncles that I can be like, you know what, Aunt Cheryl would be way better at, at managing this particular thing. Go next door and talk to her. Um, and sometimes it's as small as, you know, one time I, I walked out recently and my daughter had like been playing in the garden, had a ton of mud on her feet, and I came out and my neighbor Deborah, who's in her 40s, she's an artist, sculptor, doesn't have any kids, was washing my kids' feet. And it was like, I didn't ask her to do that. It's, it's just the nature of the community that we were then gonna go into Common Meal and there she was making sure my didn't track mud in the common house, right? And, and some of you probably experience this with neighbors on different levels, um, but there's this way in which even these tiny moments are so touching and put me in touch with how far we've gone from that, how, how privatized we've gotten. And you see all these stressed out parents working parents who feel like the entire world is resting on their shoulders and something as small as like seeing someone else clean the mud off your kid's feet is like, oh yeah, we weren't supposed to do this alone. Like that feels so good. And for Deborah, it was actually, you know, a fun experience too. So revolutionary parenting, radical hospitality. Um, the reason these haven't spread further faster, let me just give you, this is the common house I mentioned. This is a common meal, you know, this is what we look like when we all eat together. Um, the reason this hasn't spread farther and faster is largely financial, right? It's, it's very hard to figure out how to finance these kinds of structures. Um, but it's also cultural. It's hard to do things with groups, right? Has anyone ever tried to do anything with more than one person? <laughs> yeah, it's hard. So um, I, I really lucked out. My husband and I you know, moved in in 2013. And this was after years of this community dealing with all of the hard stuff that comes with deciding how much you know, what kinds of rules to have, how much togetherness, how much solitude, all of those questions. And so it's hard to do this, both on, on that sort of psychological, cultural level and on the financial level. Um, I wrote a piece, for, if you're really interested in, in kind of how this is happening and how it could happen more, I wrote a piece for the New York Times about co-housing that looks at some of the new financial structures and, and some of these challenges um, that I'm not going to get into now because we just don't have time. Um, but, and the good news is you don't have to have, this is a very pure form of co-housing, right? We are really living co-housing with like the shared internal courtyard, we have a shared garden, bike shed, we share laundry, etc. But a lot of people are doing this in, in smaller ways, right? In ways that are less time and money intensive. Um, you know, there's multi-generational housing that I'm sure lots of people in this room have thought about. From 2007 to 2009, the country experienced its largest increase in multi-generational households in history, from 46.5 million to 51.5. The historic low was in 1980. Now, this was largely spurred by the downtown eco downturn economy, um, but it turns out people actually like living with their relatives. Here's another story we tell that just does not match the reality. It's sort of these, like, boomerang kids who move into the basement and they're not paying rent and they're acting like total a-holes and everyone's like at each other's throats. Like that of course is one slice of reality. I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, families are always complicated. But the truth is that more than three quarters of those living in multi-generational households says they re their relationships have improved, right? A lot of people actually like living this way. Anyone in here live in a multi-generational household? Okay, I won't ask whether you like living that way. But, but if you do, you're not alone, right? But the message in the media is that it's this like shameful thing almost. It's a very weird way that we talk about multi-generational living, which was further weird when you think about that the Obama White House was a multi-generational house, right? Um, but it, and it's not just elite and wealthy. There's an online site called Coabode where single moms looking to share homes with other single moms have found, and it has 70,000 users. So like, people are really looking for other ways to group together to live. Um, the growing popularity of college co-ops, I think, has a lot to do with this. And I know there are some here at Stanford. Um, these kind of postgraduate householding arrangements. The biggest increase in living with unrelated adults is, has been among 25 to 34-year-olds. Um, and yes, a lot of this is economic necessity, but it turns out it actually cuts down on isolation too, right? So there are a lot of, of benefits of not being able to live alone. Um, we're starting to sow these communal so seeds all over America, dismantling the white picket fence and building something more interdependent in its stead. We're techies and teachers, nurses and engineers, architects and accountants, we're owners and rent renters, subletters and squatters, we're married couples, single parents, elders, aunties, cousins, and siblings. We're less invested in the perfect family than we are the imperfect village. We're what Bella DePaulo calls life space pioneers people who understand the need for solitude and social ties to be intertwined. 
She writes, does anyone know her work? I love her. She does really good stuff. If you haven't checked it out, you should. The special 21st century adaptation of village life is that autonomy matters as much as interconnectedness. So many people, when I, when I tell them I live in co-housing, have one of two reactions. Either they're like, oh, I want to live that way. Why doesn't everyone live that way? Or they're like, that totally freaks me out. Like, is that some sort of arrangement where no one has any boundaries? Like, I'm an introvert. I would hate that. Interestingly, I would, I would venture that the majority of those who live in my co-housing community are introverts. And, and one of the ways in which it functions is that it actually creates expectations around interaction in a way that's comforting to introverts. So we actually don't just like walk into each other's houses unannounced. Um, there may be people of individual relationships like that, but the assumption is your house, which has everything a normal house would have, is your space, and that the shared spaces are shared spaces. And so of course, yes, we are friendly to each other when we see each other in the courtyard, but people really have a sacred honor for that people need their alone time, even so much as you can come to a common meal, grab your food, and leave, and there's no questions asked. It's just like, you know, that person needed to, to do their own thing. I mean, if you did that many meals in a row, someone would go knocking to make sure you were okay, right? And that's the other side of this, is that you are, you are being witnessed but in a way that feels like it's looking out for your well-being um, as opposed to sort of some kind of more malicious, gossipy thing, right? Um, so I want to move on quickly to, to get your thoughts and your questions. Um, so I'll just conclude this way. Gloria Steinem has said, dreaming is a form of planning, which means you have to be careful what you dream, where your dreams come from, how healthy, realizable, just they really are. You might accidentally be planning for a life that won't make you happy or healthy, one that isn't even possible, which is a sure recipe for bitterness. In these dark days, in my opinion, in what often have felt sort of nightmarish, I invite all of us to wake up. Wake up to the mythologies about your own success that you're letting guide your decisions about what you spend money and attention on, who you spend time with, how you feel about yourself. And when I say wake up, I want to be really clear. I'm not really talking, for the most part, to people of color or low-income people in this country. I'm mostly talking to white people, because we are the ones who continue to perpetuate this notion of the American dream as some sort of thing that really did exist and was never morally corrupt, both of which, as I said, I think is, is wrong. In Mer Michael Eric Dyson's new book, which I highly recommend, it's called Tears We Cannot Stop, A Sermon to White America, he writes, whiteness is made up. And that white history disguised as American history is a fantasy, as much a fantasy as white superiority and white purity. Th those are all myths. They're intellectual rubbish, cultural garbage. The quicker you accept that, the better off you'll be, and so will the rest of us. In other words, the sooner we admit, as I said in the beginning, that the dream is dead, and even when and if it was ever alive, it was morally corrupt, the sooner we can get on to really living the sooner we can get on to creating more fulfilling, values-aligned lives, more interconnected communities, more humane policies, more longevity. We can also see ourselves differently in this moment. If you think you're a failure, I've got good news for you. You might be a success by standards you haven't yet honored. Maybe you're a mediocre earner, but a masterful father. Maybe you never bought your dream home, but you host legendary neighborhood parties. And if you do, please invite me. Now, if you're one of those textbook successes, and I'm sure a lot of us who are involved in the Stanford community um, would fit into this category, the implica implications are actually potentially more grim for you. You might be failing by standards that you hold dear, but that the world doesn't reward. And only you can know that. That's, that takes some soul searching, right? To be like, I'm getting the perfect grades, or I have a job that, that seems fancy and secure, but actually, I'm feeling a little bit miserable. I'm feeling disconnected. I'm feeling isolated. For many of us in this room, the biggest danger is not failing to achieve the American dream. The biggest danger is achieving a dream you don't actually believe in. Toni Morrison, who's my favorite writer, said, there's nothing, believe me, more satisfying, more gratifying than true adulthood. Its achievement is a difficult beauty and intensely hard-won glory which commercial forces and cultural vapidity should not be permitted to deprive you of. A difficult beauty, an intensely hard-won glory. That's what I wish for you and that's what I wish for myself. In the midst of such economic and political dysfunction and widespread uncertainty, we may indeed be insecure. In fact, I would say there's no question we are insecure at this moment. <laughs> But that, you know, we don't have an FBI director at the moment. So let's just say, we're a little insecure, guys. <laughs> 
But that insecurity can either make us brittle or supple, depending on how we relate to it. We can turn inward, adopt a psychology of deprivation, lose faith in the changeability of institutions, even lose faith in the changeability of ourselves. Or we can turn outward, adopt a psychology of abundance, cultivate faith in the changeability of institutions based on the rich history of this country, where even the most intractable systems have at different moments been profoundly remade. We can believe in our ability to change, to adapt, to create. We can wake up, and then we can stay awake. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm eager to hear your thoughts. And um, we have a microphone, so if you can wait until the microphone comes to you, because we have people tuning in live who won't be able to hear you. Thank you. Um, in the beginning, you, you talked about um, what was driving Trump voters, and you talked about a statistic showing the pessimism of white Americans, and that many of them don't believe that their children will have a better life than they have, um, than their parents. And, um, but one thing that struck me, and, and then you also talked a little bit about the, the American, obviously the American dream being dead, central thesis of what you're talking about. Um, but if you look, there's um, a poll that happens every few years, the Heartland poll, hmm. and it's about um, optimism, and they have race and ethnicity breakouts. And I know for Hispanics and blacks, consistently they are more optimistic than white Americans. Um, by a very large mar margin, and then especially on that question, if you believe your children will have a better life than you have, mm -hmm. um, Hispanics and blacks are much more likely to believe that. And in some ways, I think that the American dream is more, um, there's more faith in that in, in these minority communities um, than you see in the white community. And so I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that, because you brought that up um, at least once in your discussion. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, I think part of that is this, this notion of upward mobility, right? If you look at the, the sort of income level of black and Hispanic families in America, it's lower. So the actual sort of rational calculus of could your kids make more than you for that population is actually easier for them to make more than their parents, right? Whereas you have a lot of privileged white Americans who are saying, no, actually my kids are not gonna make more than I did. And I'm worried about that because the metric in people's minds is still the more money the better, no matter what, right? So if, for, for a lot of people who buy into this sort of American dream ideology, it's like you want your kids to at least make as much as you did. The notion that they would make less than you freaks you out for the most part. Um, you don't think so? I'm no, watching your facial. Well, it's, for example, my uncle's a farm worker. Right. Do I make more than him? Yes. Right. You know, and so do all of his kids. Right. So, um, it, it, and I think the notion of gaining more economic security um, over generations, especially if you come from an immigrant family, um, is, it's true. It's, uh, it's an important goal. And at least some basic minimum, you know, just Right, you know, but that's not poverty. But but our conversation is so impoverished about the way money actually functions. So, for one example, there's a chapter in the book on money, and I look at the the happiness research around economic um, sort of levels and happiness. And I'm sure lots of people have heard this, but there's a happiness plateau that a lot of researchers believe that beyond seventy thousand dollars a year you don't get exponentially more happy. You can't like keep making more money and you just keep getting more happy. So they adjust for different regions of the country, et cetera. So like in Hawaii, you need to make 116,000. In Mississippi, you need to make 60. Um, but, but, so, but we don't talk about that, right? First of all, we don't really talk about money in our culture because it, it freaks us out, money in this way. But, or with our kids, for example. So a lot of kids like don't even know how much money their parents make and, and how that translates to how they make choices and whether those choices have made them happy and all these questions. But, but there is this notion that $70,000 is some kind of bar for which if you make more than that, you won't be more happy. If you make less than that, you will be less happy. Right? So it's not to argue there, that money doesn't translate into security at some level and or a quality of life, but it's to argue that we have to be, we have to interrogate our own assumptions about at which level does it stop increasing our, our quality of life? If you're making 100,000 a year, but you're at the office 24 seven, and you don't get to be with those parents who work so hard for you to get a better life, 
Like, is that a higher quality of life? So some of those, you know, sort of nuances that we've lost in, I think, very often in the public conversation. And interestingly, on the sort of immigrant uh, question, I've had a lot of first-generation immigrants who have been contacting me and saying, I gave the book to my parents because I can't, it's, it's such a painful conversation to talk about the ways in which I don't want to honor the version of the dream that they're, they've had in their heads, um, but I can't explain what it is I do want. And so in some ways, you're at like this sort of third party that I'm using to say, like, no, I don't want to be a doctor or a lawyer, but it's not that I want to like sit on the couch and not honor you. Like, I do want to do some things, but it might not be the things that in your head when you work so hard to put me in the position you put me in that you thought I would do. So it's, it's a very painful conversation for a lot of people too, I think. But really good, good question. Can, uh, related to this, can you comment on universal income? Is, is that a piece of this kind of new way of living? Yes, so universal basic income, um, which people might be sort of familiar with, it's, it's been really, I think, exploding in kind of popular conversation lately, is this notion that in the age of automation and as the workforce, as I mentioned, is totally shifting and changing, perhaps the best investment of money would actually be to guarantee every single person in America a universal basic income so that they can, beyond that, pursue whatever opportunities they can, but their basic needs would be met. So you'd sort of get rid of the very complex bureaucracy involved with our current social safety net, um, which, you know, has, is legendarily inefficient um, in helping people uh, feel independent and, and thrive and actually just give people universal basic income. That's another one that is, it's fascinating to see the people who are interested. I mean, this is not a new idea by any means. Martin Luther King talked about universal basic income. Like, it, you know, it's not, nothing new under the sun here, but it just happens to be reaching this sort of tipping point in who knows about it and who talks about it and who cares about it, including especially a lot of people in Silicon Valley. So a lot of tech entrepreneurs are recognizing that, like, I mean, we could talk about where their motivation lies, but to some extent, recognizing that the, the things that they're building don't actually create jobs, and that if they want to keep having consumers, they need to make sure that people have a way of, of having a basic income, a basic level of subsistence, slash, like, you know, in Marxian terms, the proletariat is going to rise up if it has no way of, of, you know, making money. We have kind of like internal warfare, which to some extent, obviously, we're seeing a, a, a sort of breath of that, that people are getting really angry that there aren't, there aren't jobs and there isn't access and there's so much insecurity. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by the universal basic income. Most recently, uh, Chris Hughes, who was one of the early co-founders of Facebook and a woman um, who I actually talk about in the book, Natalie Foster, who's done a lot of the early work on organizing people in the gig economy, have come together and created something called the Economic Security Project, which if you're interested in universal basic income, you might check out. Um, and they're trying to do a bunch of new pilot programs. There's a, one of the most interesting pilots is actually in Oakland. There's a small group who's getting universal basic income and they're studying you know, what happens. But all of the research on universal basic income shows that people do not get demotivated to work which is like the first question everybody has is like human nature, like people need to w work. If you just give them money, they're not gonna want to work. No, people need to work because they need meaning in their lives and so having a universal basic income has proven again and again not to demotivate people to work. What we don't know is on a longer term basis, you know, speaking of longevity, what happens to communities who get universal basic income. Do cities thrive? We don't really know. There, are, there aren't a lot of studies on longer term stuff. We just know from a couple of short term experiments what happens. Yeah. Reinventing the American dream. What I see is that money can't buy peace, kindness, or honesty. Uh, everyone thinks of economic security. Uh, I feel that this is the universal dream of the world. It mm -hmm. should be like that. But what happens is that it's not necessary that when you are rich, still you are happy. Or when there is no economic security, means you are unhappy. So I, I suggest that it may be that the true values, what is good, what is fair, need to be spread to mm. the younger generation or everybody. That is one. And secondly, those who are doing well, who are rich, need to do more of a social services. Mm -hmm. This can alleviate uh, what we discussed. That's what I understand, you see. Uh, 
I, I'm not from US, I'm visiting US, but it was mm. so nice to attend this lecture. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, you know, this is a very American book in the sense that that's where I reported and that's, I'm interrogating the American dream. But, you know, there are many countries that have historically done much better, on, like Denmark is co-housing capital of the world, right? So there are many countries that, that have operationalize some of these values much more effectively than we have. And we should be looking to them as to learn from them and, and be models. There's such a, there's often such an arrogance in the conversation about the American dream as if we invented the high quality of life when in fact a lot of the things we invented have actually lowered our quality of life um, in ways that we haven't acknowledged. Thank you. Well, thanks for your powerful comments. Uh, it's truly amazing. When you say that the American dream is dead and it only applied to a certain part of the population, I would contend that a version of that are the boomers who are approaching their retirement years and were sold on the concept of retirement. Yeah. And that dream is dead for m most boomers approaching retirement. Right. So I think it's a special version of your conclusions. And I'd just Great. like you to comment or talk about that particular generation's issues. That's a great point. I mean, retirement is such a good study and what I'm trying to get at too because it's, on the one hand, it is dead. A lot of people can't retire and they were raised to believe that that, you know, they were going to have these, you know, quiet, beautiful, non-working years. But then the other thing is, do, are people happier when they retire, right? A lot of people actually either don't want to retire or when they do retire realize they're really unhappy, that they, they have, been sold this thing about like sitting on a beach somewhere and actually they still want to be vital and connected to people and making a difference in the world, et cetera, which we were talking about Encore Careers and all this great work um, that Mark Friedman and others are doing around that. So I think it's such a good, good case study and our, our lack of imagination of this notion that like everyone wants to and deserves to stop working at, you know, 65 or whatever age we say and that that will be that that is for, that's what happiness is. It's our same delusion about vacation, right? That like we think we're so happy on vacation and then we get on vacation and we're like, I'm still the same person and this is my husband and these are my kids, you know? So it's like, I think it's, a, it's an extended, more textured version of that of like what actually makes people happy. It might be working less. Um, it certainly is being able to hold on to their home and, you know, age in place, as we were talking about the Center for Longevity has been doing cool work about aging in place and being in intergenerational communities like the one I'm in. Um, but we pay so little attention to that conversation. We talk so much more about just straightforwardly, can, you know, when can you retire, save up for retirement, but what does, like, retirement actually look and feel like? Um, and I've, I've experienced this personally watching my parents. Um, my dad had chronic migraines, so he actually retired earlier than most people. And it's been such a struggle for them. to fig and, and they actually are financially secure. Um, but to, to find that way of being in the world, because I feel like there just isn't enough conversation about what that looks like, or enough kind of cultural media images of what that looks like. We were talking about Frankie and Gracie earlier, too. and like. You know, we need more shows, we need more movies, we need more like real textured, interesting storytelling about what retirement means and looks like instead of this like guy on the Hawaiian beach, uh, I mean the Hawaiian shirt on the beach, you know, um, which I think is sort of the popular image of what retirement is. So, you, I mean, I'd like to learn from you and others who are, are doing older age in an awesome way. Thank you for the lecture. It was really interesting. So uh, I just want to tell you this new American dream that you said, you know, having a, having a huge house and uh, having well-settled kids, educated and well-settled kids, and all those dreams that you talked about, you're not alone in that. So this is the kind of uh, notion and the set expectations of almost all parents of this generation for their kids. So I come from India, and I would say that the American parents expect way lesser of their kids than Indian <laughs> parents do. Wow. I'm, uh, yeah, so it is, in America, you can be, a, you are supposed to, you know, the parents expect you to be a doctor or a lawyer, or, but in India, you have like two options. You become a doctor, you become an engineer, and that's it. You, you can't choose anything else. You right. know? That is the expectations of um, at least 90% of the parents in India. And uh, another thing that I want to add is the co-inhabitation. So here it's different. The, the system is different. You know, kids move out once they're older, once they're 18, they move out. So in India, earlier, 
uh, we used to have a concept of something called as a huge family that lives together. So you, right from your grandparents to your parents to their siblings to your kids, everybody lives together. So you have, at the same time, you might have like 25 people living in the same household. Yeah. So that kind of reduced or receded in the uh, early 2000s. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and, and uh, everybody started thinking that, you know, if you start moving out and you have nuclear families, like just parents and kids, you start becoming more financially stable and then you can do well in life. Oh, wow. But that now declined again. Again, now in the tw after 2010s, it's people started understanding that you know having your parents around, your grandparents around, your your brothers and sisters, and you know having this this cohabitation is actually way more um, convenient, happier, and way more successful if you look at it at a broader aspect. Right. So. This whole thing that wow. you have, I would just want to say that, you know, it is something common. It is not just you alone. It's yeah. not just the Americans alone. It is a struggle that people all around the globe is facing, you know, wow. this, this expectation set yeah. and, you know, trying to meet that. It's quick question. I know we need to end, but quick question to you. When, when it did in, you were saying in the aughts, people were moving into nuclear families and that was, do you think that was an American, was influenced by sort of the American notion of the dream or is it? You don't attribute it to that? Uh, I don't think so. It okay. was just that, you know, people, to be very honest, people started getting more selfish about their own family. Like, so they wanted their finances and their security to stick to their family, and they didn't want to share it with everybody, you know. They just felt that doing that would make them lesser successful or less happier than the rest of them, you know. Or if if there was like, let me say, if, if there was a couple and they had some sibling and they were like not as educated and they had a well-off job, living together means you would have to share your finances mm. and your facilities with them as well. Got so it. they didn't want to do that at some point of time, you know. Say so they started moving out, they started living only with their children and providing only for their children. Yeah. So um, it kind of backfired. Yeah. And now everybody's wanting to co-inhabitate again. That's so, so interesting. Yes. Uh, so you're not alone. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for sharing that.